in 30 years, you'll be more disappointed by what you didn't do than by what you did do. What's going on? This is Cooper. So I recently went on the Real Fit podcast with my host, Cade. Uh, he came over. We did a little podcast episode here. So we're going to be talking about all about health, longevity, fitness, biohacking, nutrition, everything in here. So get back to the episode here. Hopefully you guys enjoy. What, what got you into it, bro? I mean, have you always been like a, a fitness guy? Has it always been like a huge passion of yours? Or was there yeah. like a certain time that, you know, kind of sparked it or... Yeah, it's interesting because you know, kind of as like a, I guess as a teen, grown, you know, growing up as a kid, I was never really all that interested, played some sports here and there. But I think it was really like probably what most people get into fitness for is they just want to like look good, right? So in like high school, you know, I'm seeing people work out, being fit, doing all this stuff. And I'm like, damn, I want to look good. I want to figure out how to, you know, build muscle, how to look good, how to be healthy, be stronger, all that sort of stuff. So that kind of got me into it. I started lifting probably like 16 years old. Mm. Um, and then just all throughout like college and stuff like that. And then slowly started to realize that I was like, oh, healthy food is like good for you. And you can actually eat healthy food that tastes good. And yeah, that just kind of got me, got me into it. And I just kept getting like deeper and deeper and deeper into it. And I just kind of like always nerded out on certain things. My mom was, would always tell me like, you should go into medicine. You should go, you should go be a doctor. You look like, you look like you'd be a doctor. (laughs) (laughs) I appreciate that. Yeah. And, um, I think that's a compliment. Yeah. 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 (laughs) And, uh, she was like, yeah, you should be a doctor. Uh, and I was always like, nah, nah, I'm not going to be a doctor. Like, I'm not going to go to medical school. That's like so much stuff. But she's like, well, you always talk about things and then you research and you're like, you talk about biology. And I'm like, I guess it's just a natural interest of mine. Yeah. So, yeah, same here, bro. I mean, growing up, I was always like tall and skinny and, uh, you know, I played football and stuff and I was always like the skinniest person on the team. So for me, same kind of thing. I wanted to look better. I wanted to feel better about myself. Yeah. So bodybuilding for me was like the first thing I I really got into. Um, I I probably don't look like a bodybuilder, but that's like, I love bodybuilding. I love everything about it. YouTube, you know, I would look up, you know, how to eat like a bodybuilder and things like that, how to train like a bodybuilder. And one of the things for me that I notice is like when it comes to fitness is that's where most people start. And then, you know, with just the looks and stuff like that. And then the more yeah. you kind of get into it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's so much more than just looks, but, um, totally. if, for a beginner, bro, like, you definitely look like a bodybuilder, bro. <laughs> yeah, I feel like <laughs> you're I saw, definitely jacked. Yeah. I feel like, um, I mean, for, for a beginner, what would you say is, I mean, just the basics. I would say one of the most basic things when it comes to health is eat real food. It can come just down to that. You know, I think it's tough because like we've come so far in our, in our existence in America, in our time and place in the world is that like, we just eat like shitty food. That's just manufactured and created from things that are really not all that natural. So when you think about, I think it's really easy to just think about, well, when we were around like thousands of years ago, well, what was around plants were around, we can get into that. Some people are, you know, against plants. Some people are not, but like meat, obviously, um, beans, like sweet potato, fruits, all that stuff was around, you know, all that stuff was around, um, all that time ago. And so I think it's just like, just kind of start there. If you can keep your ingredients super simple, like when you look at a label on food, which is what I do a lot, I I geek out over that, like always turning around the, the bottle or whatever I'm buying. It's like, is there a laundry list of things on there or is it just a few things? You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that's one of the biggest things is just pick a whole food diet that you actually like and that you can stick to. Because as you know, in the fitness world, the best diet is the one that you stick to. It's not the Atkins diet, the paleo, the this, the that. It's like, it's just the one that you're going to stick to. Yeah, no doubt. What would you like? How would you describe whole foods? What's the easiest way? If someone's like, what are are whole foods? I would say whole foods are single ingredient foods. Mm -hmm. So like sweet potato, steak, broccoli. You know, it's just, it's just one thing versus if you look at like a cracker and there's definitely, don't get me wrong. There's definitely healthy types of crackers and things like that out there. But if you look at like most crackers, most chips or most like desserts and things like that, you look at the label and there's like 10, 15, 20 ingredients in there, flavorings, artificial colors, added sugar, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, bro. For me, um, same here, man. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed is, uh, going out, going out to eat at different, you know, whether it's not, not even fast food, but restaurants as a whole, if you ask them, hey, what do you cook your food with? It's it's always seed oils. It's always yeah. soybean oil, yep. uh, canola oil. Um, and then, like you said, when you look at on the back of, you know, boxes and things like that, it's so hard to, to just eat real food in, in today's world, bro. It's, it's kind of yeah. it's kind of crazy. Like when you get um, a little bit, you know, when you get aware of these things, you know, because for so many people, they're not even aware of it. They see, totally. you know, like a 
you know, just a box of whatever and, and they think it's healthy because it says reduced fat or, you know, low sugar, but yeah. then you look on the back of it and it's, it's not healthy when you see all right. the ingredients on there. Yep. Um, would you say like, wh- how would you say, um, like for you, for yourself when you're going out to eat at restaurants or things like that, what are some keys for you to, to, to just eat real food? You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. One of the things you touched on, which is to just ask them, Hey, like, what do you cook your food in? Or for me, one of the, one of the hacks that I use at restaurants is to, when I'm ordering, is to ask the waitress or waiter, I say, hey, um, I'm actually allergic to all seed and vegetable oils. Um, can you cook this in butter? And a lot of times they're like, uh, and sometimes they have to like ask. And, you know, if you're with friends or you're with family, it's like maybe a little bit annoying, but it's like, it's worth it. I do, do the same thing. Do the annoying thing, right? Which is like, hey, can, or just the simple part, which is just like, you can skip that and just say, hey, can you please cook this in butter? Can you make sure to tell the chef, whoever, that I want this cooked in butter? Well, uh, if someone's wondering, like, what are seed oils? What are seed oils? Yeah, so uh, seed oil it, it, there's kind of a there's kind of a big group of like seed oil. Like, there's seed oils, and then there's like vegetable oils. So things like canola oil, sunflower oil, rice bran oil. Um, there's some other ones out there. I already said canola oil, sunflower. There, there's a bunch of them. Yeah. They all kind of fall into the same category. They're basically they're basically oils that are super high in omega sixes. Uh, which is like a type of fatty acid. And essentially it's just that those are highly inflammatory oil, oils. So our bodies have like, we consume omega-3s, we consume omega-6s as well. And the omega-6s are more inflammatory. And when we have an imbalance of omega-6s and omega-3s, that's what creates inflammation. Chronic it's, uh, inflammation, things like that in the in body. In the gut, right? Isn't it like a lot of gut, gut problems? Yeah, it can. It can inflame kind of like your gut, can lead to other issues in there as well. Um, but overall, it's just not good for our health. Like anything that inflames our body, chronic inflammation is just not good. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, what does your diet in particular look like on a, like on a day-by-day basis? If someone's wondering, all right, well, don't eat this, don't eat this, don't eat this. What do you eat? Yeah. So mainly I'm eating mainly whole foods. So um, a lot of people will kind of say like the paleo diet, uh, which is just all whole foods, foods that were around in like the paleolithic era. Um, but right now it's mainly about, I'm kind of doing more of like animal based. So animal based is like kind of mainly carnivore. You're eating like a lot of meat, eggs, like avocado, and then some fruit. So getting most of my carbohydrates from like fruit, honey, or maple syrup. Do you follow a carnivore MD? The, he was on, I do. Yeah, he was on Rogan's yeah. podcast. Yep. Yeah. yeah he, he's a good dude. I think he's got a lot of He's got a lot of interesting views and perspectives. I, I agree with a lot of the things that he says. Yeah, for me, I, I try to do the same. My diet looks mainly like uh, meat, whole, whole food, you know, meat and then fruit. Yeah. And then if I do carbs, it's going to be potatoes and rice. And yeah. I don't cook with any seed oils. If I do cook, it's going to be either with olive oil or butter. Yep. Um, and for me, I, like, I totally agree, man. Whenever I, when I do eat like that, and one, of the, one of the things I notice is when I, when I binge out on like bad food after a while of eating clean, yep. I feel terrible. And it's like, yes. And, and I look back when I was Dude, younger, totally. when I was like a, a kid in, in my teenage years, and I'm like, damn, how did I eat like that? How did I go to school? And uh, how did I eat like that? When, yeah. One of the things, um, I talked about this on a previous podcast, I'm curious to hear your take on it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, is like with school, I feel like we don't really learn how to eat right in no. school no never uh, and I, I really i wonder the question like is it is it intentional or is it just one of those things i, I don't i don't i personally don't know the answer but why don't why don't you think we learn about these things in school and what's your take on that this might be a hot take but i don't think that our teachers are particularly well educated in anything but specifically when it comes to that might sound bad but <laughs> when it comes to health and nutrition like they're, a lot of them are not nutritionists they're not people that geek out over health they're not fitness experts they're not they're not foodies right they're just teachers i mean if they're trying to teach somebody that's like a child that's like three five ten years old like you don't have to be that smart <laughs> to teach somebody that's young you know just kind of like basic stuff so i think that's part of it and i just think that if you if you were to look at like all the different like educators who are in the country who are, you know, teaching elementary school, middle school, high school, like they're probably not all that healthy either. They're eating all the bad shit that everybody else is eating as well. And so they just really don't know. Yeah. Yeah, It's a lack of education, which I think is a big problem. Yeah. It's it's sad, bro. Like day to day life, um, you know, at my job or going to the grocery store, it's, you see so many people who are, who are unhealthy. And I don't think it's like, 
I don't think everybody's just lazy. I don't. I really don't think that's the issue. I think it's an information issue. I think people totally. just definitely just don't know how to eat right. You know what I mean? And it's it's yeah. definitely sad. Um, but I, I, th- I think it is. It's ignorance, right? Yeah. It's people, and it's and it's um it's innocent ignorance, yeah. right? Like there's nothing inherently wrong with it. You're not a bad person because you're ignorant. You just don't know what you don't know. But if you're purposefully not educating yourself because you just you don't want to illuminate or you don't want to find out the bad, then it's like, then I don't think that's good. Bro, if you go back and like, at least where I, where I went to school, it was like pizza and fries for lunch every day. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So well, I wanted to ask you again, like, how come you don't think this is more a part of like the the learning the learning in school? Yeah, I think I think there's a couple things, kind of what I touched on previously, which is that I just don't think that the people in our schools, the cooks, the superintendents, principals, teachers they're not well educated on on food, on nutrition, on what's good for us. And then the other thing is that part of the reason that we eat such shitty food is because it's cheap. And we're always thinking about business, we're always thinking about logistics, it's like how can we get the cheapest amount of food in here? What's gonna give us the, the best bang for our buck? And oftentimes when we do that, when we focus on, uh, you know, when we focus on price, we're gonna sacrifice in quality. So I think that's a big reason it's just unfortunate, but we've just come such a long way, mm. you know, from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, like all the way up to the 2010s and 20s where we're at right now. It's just like it's just been progressively like now we're at a point where like nobody that's currently alive today really knows what it's like to not eat the classic shitty American diet. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Um, what was I going to say? I was going to say, oh, I, I was listening to this this little clip on, I, mean, I think it was YouTube or Instagram. And he was talking about comparing business versus fitness. And he was saying, and you kind of touched on this just recently, which brought it up in my mind, but he was saying, comparing fitness to business. And he was saying, I, w- I would pick fitness all day long. I would pick health and fitness all day long because, mm-hmm. you know, if, if you get your health in order, that kind of straightens out everything in your life. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like it, it makes you a better person. It makes you a better businessman. It totally. makes your mind more clear. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Talk about like the relationship between your body and your mind and how, because, you know, I, th- I think we kind of hit on it earlier. A lot of people think when they think of fitness or whatever, they think of just getting muscles and looking good. But yep. talk about like the relationship between the body and the mind and how like, man, if you get your if you get your body right, if you get everything running right, like your mind will operate so much better. Totally. I think the biggest thing that it comes down to there is discipline. Mental discipline is one of the most important things you can possibly focus on. And you need that to get in shape. You need that to be able to adhere to a diet, to stick to nutrition. You like you have to have that. You have to have that what we call impulse control. And that is going to translate in all other areas of life, business, relationships, skill building and everything. So if you can figure that out and food's one of the hardest things to do it with. We're so engineered. We're so geared these days to just reach for something every two minutes, reach for a snack, reach for a beverage, a consumption, alcohol, whatever, that if we can figure out how to control that and tell our mind, no, then it's going to be so much easier when we have to like cut out distractions to like build a business or to build a skill set. Yeah, no doubt. I've, I've talked about this a lot on, on my podcast. That's, that's one of my biggest messages right there is basically utilizing fitness as your vehicle to just become overall like a better person. Yep. And like you said, in today's world, it's so easy to, to binge out on food, to binge out on, on TV, to binge out on, on all of these different yep. things. Like we have all of these instant pleasures at our disposal 24-7. Totally. And I totally agree, man. I think, you know, fitness uh, or discipline is, is the key to, to everything. And, yeah. And you know, if you can learn that through fitness and kind of apply it to different aspects of your life. I think that's well, t- totally agree. Well, think about this for the average American, for the average person getting six pack abs is like the most difficult thing you could ever possibly think about doing. <laughs> you know, like we could talk to, we could go pull people on the street out here and we could say, Hey, what would you rather do? Build a business that makes, you know, $300,000 in profit a year or get six pack abs. What's easier? And most people would be like, I'd rather build the business, <laughs> you know, um, just because it's like, it takes so much discipline. It takes so many different, you know, things that you need to change in your life to be able to do that, that it's like, it's tough for most people. So if you can figure that out and maybe it's, maybe it's not six pack abs, maybe it's just how to put on muscle or adhere to a diet. But if you can figure that out, the possibilities are endless, bro. You're conquering your mind at that point. And that translates to so many different areas of life. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree, man. I, that's, that's hilarious. Um, 
as far as like biohacking goes in different ways, like outside of just um, the basics on on diet, as far as like cold plunges, as far as saunas, as far as yep. intermittent fasting, I've I've uh, kind of gone through your content a little bit yeah. on Instagram, and you talk a lot about these things. And um, what are some of the benefits of the sauna? Yeah, so for the sauna, I think that one is big on mental discipline too. Like I can tell you that yesterday. One of the things I was doing is I went into the sauna and I, I had it cranked up. What I do with the sauna every time is I go and I turn it on and I leave it for like 20, 30 minutes before I ever get in so that I make sure that it's like hot as fuck before I get in there. And then I go in there and, and yesterday what I did is I had my headphones in and I, I played a um, I played a 15 minute unguided meditation in there and I put it on and I basically said to myself, um, I said to myself, hey, are we we're going to, we're going to stick to this 15 minute meditation and I'm going to sit there with my hands on my knees and I'm not going to move a muscle. I'm not going to open my eyes or do anything until the 15 minute meditation is up. And man, I can tell you by like 10 minutes, I was like, fuck bro. When is this going to stop? Like, this is, this is terrible. Like I'm sweat is just beating down, dripping all over me. I feel like disgusting. I'm not wiping it. I'm not moving. And then I was just like, no, like we're, we're sticking to it because there's that, there's that inner voice. Joe Rogan always talks about that inner bitch, yeah. conquer your inner bitch, right? It's that inner bitch. That's like, dude, move already. Or like, dude, you're good enough. You've done it. Like you can move. It's, it's fine. Like, you know, you're not going to get, you're not going to get a negative consequence if you open your eyes right now. And it's like, no, I will. Because like, I would have like lied to myself. I would have said I was going to do something and then I didn't do it. And so I think the mental discipline of just saying, hey, I'm going to do 15 minutes. Hey, I'm going to do 20 minutes and then actually sticking to that. Yeah. Not compromising. Not compromising. It's not a, taking the shortcut. Kind of like you said, it's so easy, like 10 minutes in. Oh, well, I mean, 10 minutes is good. You know, like mm-hmm. we don't have to go 15 minutes, you know, right. but it's like you told yourself, hey, I'm going to go 15 minutes. So sticking to that is, is yeah, it's key. What are, what are some of the physical yeah. physical benefits of, of sauna? Yeah. So with sauna, again, it's reducing inflammation and it's really good for muscle soreness as well. Plus, I think the other thing that's really, really powerful is the cardiovascular benefit. So I think that term gets thrown around all the time. Like, oh, it's good for your cardiovascular health or cardio. It's like, well, what does that actually mean? Well, it just means that it's, it's healthy for your heart and for the way that your heart pumps blood throughout your body and gets blood flow to different important areas. And so for the sauna, your heart rate increases when you get in the sauna. So your body is like starting to heat up and your heart's beating and it's pumping blood. And the cool thing is that your body doesn't really know the difference between that and between like actual cardio exercise, which is like walking or running. So it's kind of like you get this added extended benefit of cardio by just sitting in the sauna. Yeah, I heard that. I heard somebody say like your body has no, it can't tell the difference between running and being in the sauna, something like that. And I thought that was, I thought that was pretty interesting. That might be something yeah. like, you know, if you hate running, like man, just get in the sauna for, for 20, 30 minutes. Yeah, I think to a certain degree, you know, if we were to chop up like all the different benefits of cardio and what it does for you and burning calories, like I think there's definitely aspects of running and walking that like you can't get from the sauna. But as far as that cardiovascular benefit of like the butt, the the heart rate increasing, the blood pumping, you definitely do get some of those benefits, which is nice. Now that I think about it, I think a big part of like cardio in general is just the heart rate. Like that's yeah. that's a big part of it for sure. That is. Yeah. That is for sure. What about a cold plunge? Do you do like a lot of cold plunges, cold water therapy? I do. I do. So I do it probably somewhere between like four and like six days a week. I don't do it like every single day anymore. Um, and that's not really for any specific reason, but I was doing it every day during the winter time. So I would get up in the morning again, huge mental discipline thing, being able to, to go into the cold, which you know is going to like suck in the moment. Um, but then really, really good for reducing inflammation and the absolute best possible thing for muscle soreness. I could not recommend the cold plunge enough. I mean, just saturating your muscles and your body in that cold water really helps to speed up recovery. Yeah. One thing for me, I I try to do it a couple of times a week, uh, which is kind of difficult because I don't have one at my house or anything like that. But like for the, for your mood and for your like overall, just like happiness levels, dude, that's, that's like, it it really does work pretty, pretty drastically for sure. Yeah. The, the, increase of endorphins in your brain and it's kind of what it does to just make you super alert and focused is like awesome especially if you can get to a point i know the ease of access is probably the most challenging thing for most people is that they just don't have one or they have to go and drive to one and they have to pay for it and it's and it's tough but man if you can get in one especially in the morning 
you, you don't want to drink a cup of coffee or something like that, you'd rather do that. It's a great way to wake up. Yeah. What about, uh, to switch gears a little bit, intermittent fasting? Um, I, I've seen yeah. a couple of your videos about it. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the benefits and, and what got you into intermittent fasting? Yeah. So I actually started intermittent fasting pretty early in my like fitness health career, which was uh, in... It wasn't my career, but just getting into it, which was in high school, actually. And I had just seen a bunch of videos of uh, a Greg O'Gallagher, Kino Body, if, yeah. if you're familiar with yeah. him. Uh, he would make a ton of YouTube videos on intermittent fasting and all the benefits. And I was just like, that seems cool. Like that had fat burning effect and everything like that. So uh, when you do intermittent fasting, it's cool thing is your body will naturally increase its production of growth hormone, which growth hormone is really key hormone in helping your body increase muscle mass and burn fat as well so you get that plus um you get i really like how you can with intermittent fasting you're really just like narrowing down the the eating window that you have Mm. so every day you have your fasting window and then your eating window i think just compressing the time at which you're consuming food during the day it just makes it way more difficult to overeat it also makes it way more enjoyable too. Yeah. Yeah. When you're hungry, it's y- food tastes way better. And like breaking that fast is like, oh, that feels so good. I'm so glad I can like finally eat, you know? Yeah, man. For, for a while, I was, uh, my goal, like my number one goal was like just to build muscle and, and gain weight. Yeah. So I was eating like five, six meals a day. Yeah. And for me and like eating carbs with every meal. And uh, yeah. one of the downsides I felt like with that is like my mental clarity and my energy throughout the day. Totally. Was like, bro, I would... I would spike and then like right around like 11, 12, I would just, dude, my energy levels would just drop yeah. drastically. Yeah. That's a huge piece of it too, because when you're eating consistently, so like anytime you consume food at all, your, your insulin, like your blood sugar spikes and then you have like that spike and then you have like kind of a crash, which could lead to like fatigue or like, you know, your energy levels dipping. So I do it a lot for mental clarity. Intermittent fasting is great for mental clarity because in the morning, like you're just like clear, you know, you're just drinking water. Maybe you have like black coffee or tea. You don't have any like blood sugar spikes or anything that kind of messes with you. And yeah, you are a little bit hungry, but there's different ways that you can kind of suppress your appetite. I just feel that for whatever reason, when I don't have any calories, any food in my system, I'm just laser focused and super clear versus if I just have like a big breakfast or something in the morning typically like afterwards I'm just not as locked in as I was previously yeah no doubt it's like it you, you kind of brought it up earlier as far as like our ancestors and stuff I've heard a couple of people talk about this but like when our ancestors would go out and hunt in the forest and stuff or you know wherever they they were hunting like they didn't have food in their stomach you know what I mean right and I think like there's kind of the misconception and I wanted to talk about a little bit of misconceptions at least yeah in your opinion um but I think there's this misconception that like oh in order to go train in order to go do this or right when you wake up you got to eat you know what I mean like at least growing up for me it was like my mom didn't let me leave the house if I didn't have breakfast yeah and so it's kind of it's kind of funny would you kind of agree with that like there's it seems like there's a little bit of a misconception with like eating especially breakfast for the most part there is there is it's just it's just a cultural thing yeah it's just it's just so ingrained in our culture at this point to eat three meals a day to eat right when we get up whatever the case may be but it's like you don't have to do it that way um oftentimes I feel like when you identify something that's like common something that a lot of people do a lot of times you find a a lot of joy and a lot of like reward by like going completely against the grain and like doing something that's totally different from the norm but yeah it's just I mean I still love breakfast I'm always I'm always eating breakfast I just eat it later in the day yeah yeah no doubt bro for me uh I yeah like I said I definitely feel better um when I skip breakfast and having like a big dinner at, yeah. uh, like having a big dinner or even a big lunch definitely uh, helps me throughout the day. But um, what you, is your? Do you still intermittent fast? Oh uh, yeah, it, it depends. Like for me, um, I do go through periods of time where I want to gain some weight. Totally. So like if if I do go th- like right now I'm I'm kind of in that phase where uh, I want to gain some strength in, in the yeah. gym. I want to gain some muscle mass. So like right now I'm kind of eating a little bit more than I typically would. Yeah. Um, but then th- there goes th- there's times where like I, I just want to kind of get super lean and and. And that's what I prefer to do. I actually like I prefer to kind of do the intermittent fasting, eat a big dinner and then sleep really well too. eat a bunch of carbs at yeah. night yep. and just sleep like a baby. You know, yep. but um, what does your training look like, man? Um, yeah. For me, like training's everything in me. What does your training look like? 
So my relationship with training has kind of changed a lot over the years, but right now I'm doing kind of a lower volume type thing where I'm only really like lifting three, maybe four days a week. So I'm giving my body a lot of time to recover. You know, I think that's really important is, you know, prioritizing that recovery process, prioritizing those rest days. So right now, every single day I'm doing at least 10K steps. So I'll do walking in the morning, maybe walking after like my first meal, and then maybe some cardio like three to four days a week. But then as far as training, I do a lot of um, kind of body bodybuilding, like hypertrophy style training. So I'm doing a lot of like dumbbells, free weights, maybe some machines, a lot of like isolation movements and stuff like that. Because at the end of the day, I do really kind of prioritize aesthetics, looking good, feeling good. So yeah, no doubt that that's kind of similar to Keno Body. I do follow Keno Body. I know yep. he talks a lot about that. Um, yeah, he, I think he only lifts like twice a week. Yeah, right now. I know when I heard that, I'm like, damn, dude, there's no way, bro. But you know, I guess he, he's got. I think he's he's passively jacked at this point. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. I was just gonna say, yeah. You, you hear people talk about that, like Alex Hermosi talked about that in an interview, where it's like you spend so much time building up your physique and like if you're somebody that's been lifting for like 10, 20 years, like you've already put on a lot of the muscle. It's a lot easier to maintain muscle and physique than it is to like build it up initially. So you get to a certain point where you're just like, yeah, I'm kind of passively jacked right now. Like I recently got injured and I took two to three weeks off of lifting. And honestly, like to be honest, I let my diet slip a little bit too. Like I was kind of just a piece of shit, but I was like injured. Um, and I mean, at the end of it, I looked a little bit worse, but like, I still look better than most people. Yeah. Yeah. No, like for me, um, I've gone through periods of time where I go like a week without lifting and sometimes I come back and I'm stronger than I ever was. Yeah. So that, that recovery aspect is, is definitely key. Um, so we talked a little bit about your diet. We talked a little bit about your training. Uh, let's talk about like, um, what, how, when do you usually study, bro? Like, it's like, you know a lot about this shit. So yeah. like, do you like have like a set, set, set period of time throughout the day where you study or like how, how do you learn about all this, man? Yeah, I, I don't really. I mean, I listen to a lot of podcasts. Yeah. So, you know, I'll listen to Andrew Huberman. I'll listen to, you know, Peter Atia. I'll, you know, consume info from like more plates, more dates and just, you know, Paul Saladino, you know, people like that who, you know, low, know a lot in the industry. And uh, that's just kind of throughout the day while I'm on walks um, while I'm chilling, while I'm like, you know, folding the clothes or doing like random things, you know, that I need to do. But other than that, sometimes I'll just take some time off, like in the evenings to, um, you know, I'll read books as well. Like right now I'm reading life force by Tony Robbins, okay. which he has like a ton of longevity experts, doctors, medical professionals, nutritionists, all these people that have like he's studied and that he's worked closely with. And they just like have all this different information that they put in the book and the different chapters, um, but then at night, if I'm just going down a rabbit hole or something like that, I'll, I'll look at stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, man. I think, uh, podcasting has changed the game just because like, you no longer have to go grab a book and sit down and like, you can now just have like earbuds in and go on a walk or do what you're doing throughout the day and, and be learning and listening. Yeah. And so yeah, that's man. a big thing that and audiobooks, dude. Yeah. And like, if you have a job and you know, you have like, like if you're a truck driver, you can work eight hours a day and be learning the whole time, you know? Yeah. So it's, that, that's a huge hack for sure yeah. is taking advantage of podcasts or just like listened media and, and audio because like the way that they kind of design podcasts is for it to be long form and for it to also be like, obviously in this podcast and any podcast, like we want you to be right there with us, being able to like learn, be able to consume this content without having to watch, without having to be like actively like watching us, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so you started putting out content, bro. What uh, what made you want to start putting out content? And like, how's, how's that journey been for you? Yeah, good question. So funny enough, I think I've always kind of longed for being in front of a camera. So when I was really young, I would go all the way back. Like when I was really young, I always told my parents and everyone else, you know, instead of like astronaut or baseball player or whatever, I was like, I want to be an actor. You know, I was like, I want to be a professional actor. I want to be, you know, in front of the camera. And, you know, as I, as I progressed, you know, things didn't really go that route. And I just didn't really get into acting for whatever reason, which is totally cool. Um, but I always had, you know, through high school and college, I always like saw kind of like influencers, educators, entrepreneurs, speaking, being in front of the camera, being charismatic. I was like, wow, that's cool. Like I look up to that. I, I like that. I think that would be really cool. And I always kind of had this like internal, I guess, guide or kind of gut feeling to do content. And then more and more recently, I'm just seeing like how content is able to help, 
you know, your business ideas help you kind of just like get out there and connect with more people. So that was a big thing for me. And I started to understand, Hey, I actually know a good amount about health and intermittent fasting and, and fitness and all this stuff. It's like, maybe I should start sharing that with people. Yeah, man. It's kind of funny. It's similar, similar thing for me. Like it's always been something I, I've always been an avid listener. I've always admired people who like are willing to get out there and put themselves out yeah. there. So like for me, hearing that from you, it's, it's pretty cool, man. It's been a kind of a new journey for me. You know, I'm just getting started with this. So I definitely look forward to like seeing like the growth, man, and seeing like where this thing, where this takes you, you know what I mean? Yeah, because it's uncomfortable, right? Yeah, yeah. It's easy in everyday life to just go around and just do what everybody else does and just, you know, talk to your friends and your your parents, your family and whatever, and just share your ideas that way. It's a whole nother thing to completely put yourself out there and be vulnerable on the internet and say, hey, I'm going to set up this camera and point it at my face and talk about the things that I hold most dear. Yeah. Talk about the things that I think about all the time. Because you're letting people in yeah. up here. And normally, unless we're friends or family, we're sitting in a comfortable, safe space, you don't let people in up here to what you're doing and show yourself. So it's a totally different thing. And it's scary and it's uncomfortable. But you know, if I've learned anything in my, uh, my 25 years of life so far is that like most of the best things are on the other side of, of that discomfort. Dude, totally, man. And I wasn't even planning on going down this path but yeah man I totally agree I think like for me bro putting myself out there was super hard it was super challenging I was like ah like first of all like who am I to talk about xyz like yeah. no one's gonna listen to me all these doubts and stuff like that but man there's like like you just said there's so much there's so much growth on the other side of of like uncomfortable you know experiences and yeah. and, and getting past getting past that like fear of of, of speaking out or of doing xyz um and for me what I've noticed too is like this has been a like forcing yourself to articulate yourself on camera and on the yeah. spot, you know, like we don't do like retakes with podcasts, you know, it's right. just on the spot, man. So, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely like, I would like part of the reason why I wanted to do this was also to like show people like, Hey man, like if you want to do a similar thing, like just start, bro. Like, yeah. you know, I don't have a ton of like experience in this or whatever the case is, but just start, man. And like at the end of the day, you know, like when I look back at, you know, when I'm 50 or 60 years old, the last thing I want to, have to like live with his man when I was 22 you know and I had that idea of like starting XYZ podcast yeah. business man like I didn't go for it and yeah. I, th I think I think about that and I like I, I try to reflect on that like man if I if I don't go for it like what's worse going for it and, and experiencing like the uncomfortable um, uncomfortability of doing it yeah or not going for it and then like having to live with for sure not going the, for the, it, you know? the fear of of regret is definitely something that you don't want something that people run from all the time. So I think that's, that makes a lot of sense. I'm, yeah, I'm the same boat. I would much rather go for something and fail and learn from it than not go for it at all. Because like I used to actually have it as my background, um, on my phone and I would look at it every day and it, I don't know if I'm going to say this exactly correctly, but it basically said in 30 years, you'll be more disappointed by what you didn't do than by what you did do. And that would just like hit. So I would just like look at that every day and I'd just be like, yeah, bro, you're, you're not going to be disappointed by something that you do. And it didn't turn out however you wanted it to, because you can always learn from that experience. Mm. There's no bad experience except for one that you don't learn from. But you but you will be disappointed if you just failed to do something or you just didn't take that step. And one of the th another thing with me with uh, with the content, man, is like I kind of had to. Uh, so I got my real estate license about a year ago and I struggled with it, bro, because I was very uncomfortable with putting myself out there yeah. and uh, just like putting that effort forward to like meeting new people, meeting strangers, things like that. And one of the things that I've experienced within the past few months of doing this podcast is like the best part about it is meeting new people through it. You know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, like life is I feel like it's about the people that you meet along the journey. Yeah. You know, and the experiences that you share with people. And like, you know, with this podcast we just did right now, bro, like I'll never forget. Like we you know, I met up with you. We did a podcast. It was fucking cool. You know, exactly. So like, man, great that, way to network. Yeah, that's that's the best part about it for me, man, with with content is meeting new people and, and having those experiences. Um, yeah, man. I mean, have you learned anything so far? Like what have you learned? What's your biggest takeaway from with content so far? We talked about a little bit, but. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, with content, I think one of the biggest things that I've, 
I kind of liked what you said earlier about how it really helps you to articulate your thoughts is like one of the best things with content is what you were telling people is like, Hey, just get started because it's like, you're going to be, you're going to be like bad at it in the beginning. Yeah. You're, you're going to mess up on camera. You're not going to know what to say. Maybe you're going to have a little bit of imposter syndrome thinking like, well, who am I to educate people? Who am I to something? It's like, but that, that stuff, it's all going to work itself out. It's going to get ironed out. It's just, it's just a learning, it's just a learning process. You're, you're going to be bad at pretty much everything that you do right at the onset, right at the beginning. But the sooner you get into it, the sooner you'll learn from your mistakes and learn from being bad at it and then, you know, being good at it will come. Yeah, man. I heard somebody, uh, talk about this. They were saying how like, man, the people actually, a lot of people, you know, if you've never done content, if you've never been in front of a camera and I had this, um, kind of misconception at first is like, you think those people have such a big ego and they're so full of themselves for getting on camera, but it's like, man, like there's actually a lot of humility that goes behind doing it. Like you just said, you know what I'm saying? Like you got to overcome all those doubts and like, so I think, I think there's a, you know, if anybody's interested in like getting into content, I would suggest it, man. I think it's a great way to grow and network and all these things. So, and it's a great way to just learn to speak and learn to articulate your thoughts. I think that's like one of the, the highest skill sets and one of the coolest things, one of the things that I think is like most respectable is people that are phenomenal at articulating themselves. You, you look at really successful entrepreneurs, you look at presidents, politicians, right? Actors, actresses, news anchors, people like, and you just think it's normal that they're able to like articulate themselves and get their point across and work an audience, work a crowd. And then you, you, if you put a camera in front of you and start talking, you realize you're like, holy shit, it's like harder to talk just in general when a camera is facing you versus just, you're just talking with your friends. Yeah. It totally turns it around and it like gives you a whole new respect for people who are on stage or, or whatever. I think your ability to do that, your ability to like talk to a crowd, hold yourself, articulate your thoughts, stay composed is like a really, really powerful skill set. And then it's like, then when you do have those conversations with people you just met or with friends or whatever, and there's no camera on you, there's no microphone in front of your face, like you're probably going to be amazing at, you're going to be an amazing communicator. Yeah, no doubt, man. So for the, for the sunlight thing, the one thing I wanted to say on that is, um, I think one of the best things is getting the sunlight right in the morning. So every single morning, what I do when I wake up is I try to get outside, out in the sun as soon as possible. Now it's awesome because where I live is most of the time very sunny, but I'll go up to the roof and typically I'll take a glass of water with me or a a cup of water, like a shaker cup with like 16 ounces of water. And I'll either put like three grams of Himalayan salt in there or I'll do an electrolyte mix. And that's really good because we're super dehydrated. Typically you go eight hours or so without drinking any water because you're asleep. So I hydrate, I take that up and I go to the roof, which is like totally exposed in sun. So I'll either like tilt my, you know, tilt my hat up, take it, take it off completely or something so that I can get the sun in my face. Sometimes I'll take my shirt off and I'll just walk laps and I'll do like, I'll try to get between like 1500 and 2000 steps in. Um, and that's really cool too, because like your eyes are always, your eyes basically are absorbing like the photons from the sun Mm. and that sun in the morning when it's like low in the sky and it's like that bright light it tells that signal to your brain hey the day is starting Mm. so we kind of start to kick in some of the serotonin some of the other like neurotransmitters in your brain that's like hey let's get the brain working let's get it started and then also kind of sends a signal for your circadian rhythm which is kind of like your body's internal clock which can help regulate you know waking up in the morning and then getting tired at night So it's like funny, you get sunlight in your eyes in the morning and that's going to help you when like the time comes to go to bed at night. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah. I've heard a little bit about circadian rhythms and I think, uh, yeah, it's like, I feel like it's, it's so funny, man. Like when you look at our, our, our world today, it's like, we, we feel like we're so advanced, but then you start looking at the fundamentals of like health and it's, it's really trying to live like that ancestral lifestyle. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's so funny how that it's because I think what we've done over the course of like what we've done over the course of several thousand years, several hundred years recently is we've tried to just be comfortable. We've tried to just optimize for comfort. Like, Hey, how can we take the smallest amount of steps? How can we make sure they're always in the perfect temperature? How can we make sure that we always are satiated with food and whatever? And that's just led to a bunch of issues that make us live an unnatural type of life. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt, bro. Yeah. Um, well, once again, man, I appreciate you doing this. I yeah, don't want to keep you too long, but, uh, 
That's uh, episode 34 of the Real Fit Podcast, man. I really appreciate you doing